Okay, let's turn over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 23. We're looking at verses 23 through 35 tonight, part 2. Bodyguard at government expense. We're in Acts chapter 23. You know, I know it's all, it's comfortable for you guys out here, but I just ran a race up and down the stairs. It's a little hot up here, but that's okay. Acts chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers, and go to Caesarea, and the horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. That, folks, is a lot of Roman soldiers. They could beat a lot of people. And provide them beasts, that they may set Paul on, and bring him safe into Felix the governor. Now, the foot soldiers, of course, had to walk that, but Paul got to ride. Isn't that interesting? And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysias, under the most excellent governor Felix, sent a greeting. Now, you know you stop and think about that. If this incident had not taken place when it did, we would never know about this guy, Claudius Lysias. Did you know every word of God is inspired? God put this man's name in Scripture because he made a right decision at the right time. What an honor. A Roman soldier, a centurion, a captain of the host at Jerusalem. And he got his name in Scripture. You know, God tells us something about that. God knows us all by name. Everyone, Jew and Gentile, pagan and believer, everyone. None of us are numbers. Every one of us has a name in the eyes of God. He knows us, and someday we'll give an account for it. I always find that interesting. The Claudius Lysias got his name in Scripture. As did Felix, who was, uh, we learn about him a little bit later on, some wishy-washy stuff going on there, uh, some corrupt stuff going on there, some government bribery stuff going on there. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. God keeps records of the bad things, too. And came, I came with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. We talked about that a little bit last week and how, well, he didn't know that right at the beginning, but he makes it sound like he did. You know, it doesn't matter what we pretend. God has the story straight. We can think it all we want. We can make other people think that certain things were so and that we were the ones to give credit for it. <laughs> But God knows the difference between truth and error, between truth and lies. And, you know, I saw a very interesting thing. I, I checked the Internet this afternoon and looked at Facebook to see if my kids had put up anything because in the last couple of days they've been putting up a lot of pictures of when they were little teeny kids. And uh, uh, it was really cute. I saw my family with a whole bunch of the other kids in our church down in Alabama all dressed up as shepherds and angels and wise men and stuff like that. A Christmas play, and it looked like in the picture that Isaiah was probably eight or nine years old, and Anatoly was maybe six or seven years old, and you know, he was a little teeny, teeny kid. I thought, wow, have they grown? Boy, they were sure cute. How did I get up on that? <laughs> anyway, God knows exactly what we've done and when we've done it. He knows where we've done it, how we did it. Oh, I know what it was. They put up a, a picture of a certain politician, and um, in that picture, the politician was standing at a po podium. I'm not going to say the name, because I'm not getting political here tonight, but I just want to give you an illustration. The politician had a hand on the podium, and another one like this over the politician's head. And the caption underneath it read, I'm a little teapot, short and old, open my mouth and out come lies. <laughs> It's like, oh, man. Yeah. God knows the lies. He knows who's faking it. He knows who in this campaign is telling the truth and who is not. Dear people, don't get discouraged. Because there is a God in heaven who not only knows, but he keeps record of it. We see some political maneuvering going on here. A guy who wants to get promotions. But God knows the truth. Remember that every time you're tempted to tell a lie, 
whatever you're tempted to fudge the truth just a little bit like Claudius Lysias is doing right here. He did the right thing, but he sort of fudged the truth. And we have both aspects of that in the scripture. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth unto their counsel. <laughs> Trying to follow the law and yet going to a group that was clearly violating not only Roman law, but also divine law. You know, that happens sometimes in churches, too. Churches supposed to be controlled by divine law in a political sphere which is controlled by national law and we see the two trying to intermingle in a way that ends up producing evil results. I think of the National Council of Churches when I'm talking about that. Whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law but who have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him, farewell. Now, he had been told that there were 40 of the Jews who were terrorists, 40 of them who were suicide bomber types. That's why he sent as many soldiers as he did. He sent 70 horsemen and 200 footmen, spearmen, Make ready 200 soldiers and horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen, 200. That's 470 people to defend Paul against 40. He knew their zeal. He knew that they would not stop. They had a focus on him. It's like in the Old Testament when the king of Syria was coming against Ahab and Joram jo uh, jo dressed up as the king of uh, Israel instead of being the king of Judah. And everybody went after him, and then they realized that it wasn't him. I mean, they had one focus. They were going to get one man. They didn't care about killing other soldiers. They were going to get one man. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow, when they left the horsemen to go with him and returned unto the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, he said, I will hear thee when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Gracious Father, we pray that as we look at this tonight and as we consider the context, as we consider the way that you have ordained work, in, in this case, you ordained military soldiers to do certain work. They didn't know it, but they were actually protecting the man who would write most of the New Testament. Most of the New Testament hadn't been written at this point. If those assassins had gotten to him, we would not have all the letters that we do. We would not have the full revelation that you had given to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul. How we thank you, Father, for government when it's functioning the way you want it to function. And even when it's not, it is under your sovereign control to accomplish your will. We thank you, Father, that you are in control. We pray that you'll help us to function as we're supposed to function under the leadership of those whom you allow to be placed and whom you indeed do place in positions of secular authority. And we pray for them, for their salvation, for their spiritual growth, for their courage to stand for right and just and truth, so that Jesus Christ will be glorified in and through the believers who are under their authority. So Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Now, last week we were talking about work, and here we see some men at work. In fact, they're being paid by the Roman government to do the work that they're doing. And they've been sent to a very miserable outpost, one of the worst possible outposts where you could be sent in the ancient Roman world <laughs> was to be sent to Israel. That was a really, really crummy location to be sent because of the attitude of the people, because they would not bow to the Roman gods. They would not assimilate the Roman gods into their own pantheon of gods. It wasn't like that in other parts of the world. Yeah, there, there were people who resented the fact that the Italians had beaten them, but they soon absorbed the Roman gods. The Jews did not. So to be sent to Israel 
to have a position even as high as Claudius Lysias has here in our passage tonight was no particular plum. You'd like to get out of there if you possibly could. Yet here are men who are doing their job, men who are being paid their pound of salt, men who slogged up and down over the miserable dry hills of Judea. They weren't up in the Galilee. They were down in Judea. They were down where they'd have to run errands after bandits down toward the Dead Sea, which is miserable territory if you've ever been there. And I've been there. And you're not riding in an air-conditioned car. You're walking. And yet, they're doing work. You know, I think all the way through the scripture we see that the military and being a part of the military is, in fact, honorable work. We were talking about work last week, remember? We find the Apostle Paul uses military illustrations. You know, fight a good fight. Keep the faith. He talks about himself that way at the end of his lifetime. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid unto me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Being a soldier is, in fact, considered honorable work. John the Baptist spoke to the soldiers who came to him, and they wanted to repent to him and said, what should we do? And he says, well, quit shaking down people. Quit roughing up people. Be content with your wages. He didn't tell them to get out of the military. He didn't tell them to become pacifists. He didn't tell them to wear the hippie peace symbol. He didn't tell them, you know, tie your sandals around your neck and, you know, wear tie-dyed shirts. Grow your hair long and go out there and do peacenik protests. He said, be content with your wages. In Scripture, it's seen as an honorable occupation. Unfortunately, we've come to a point in our history, starting back in the 60s, where military is no longer considered an honorable occupation and where our leaders have done everything that they possibly can to tear it down. Insisting that, hey, we have to have special rights for gays in the military, for example, who want to have sex change therapy. And your tax dollars are paying for it. Where there are serious politicians wanting to induct into the military girls and young ladies to fight alongside men in the battle, putting our country at serious danger, not only to consider the fact that it puts those young women at serious danger. Folks, Satan always destroys things that God has said are okay. Be careful not to move that camera, because uh, that's we just got knocked off the internet. Um, yeah, that's why we put things back there so you can't get around that end. Anyway, I hope that you all who are out there can still see. Maybe we should sing a hymn while I go back and, uh, and check the camera out. Keep you choose one. We'll sing just one verse. It'll only take me a minute to get back there and check the camera. And then we'll go on with the service. So Keith will choose a song, and we will sing. Take your time. Thanks. On topic, 731, please. protect a Christian. Did you know that's a biblical thing to do? 
right now, all of our so-called um, libertarian types, all of our so-called atheist types, are busy trying to get the government from protecting Christians. But you know, it is an okay thing to do. This passage tells us that. God is the one who arranged the situation so that Paul would have not only free transportation, but for several years would be supported by the government. Now we've been taught for so long of the quote separation between church and state was actually is not in the Constitution. That was a letter that was written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists to tell them the government wouldn't interfere with their affairs. That there was a wall of separation between church and state so that the government could not mess with the affairs of the church not so that the church could not have an impact on society around it. We've come a long way, folks, from what we see in terms of the New Testament, where the government's responsibility is to protect the truth, is to protect those whom others would seek to destroy. Let me put it in practical modern terms to protect Christians here in this country, for example, from ISIS coming in and destroying churches. But you know, I think that day is coming, and it may be in the near future, when that kind of thing goes on. And it's an appropriate thing to pay the soldiers to protect the Christians. And so that's what we see here in our text. Now, legitimate work. When we looked at Paul's nephew in the previous verses, that brought us to the importance of leaders in every sphere making sure that they set the proper example because young believers are also watching. A proper example of work in that case. Last week as background of Paul's transportation by a huge contingent of soldiers we looked at at least a few hints in scripture about Paul's family. We know for sure and we I'm just going to go very quickly through those five things that we looked at last week. Number one, we know for sure that he had at least one married sister who had at least one son, because that's what the text says. We can infer from this that he had, perhaps, more siblings, because the normal Jewish family at that time were normally large in comparison to modern American families. We talked about that in relation to what we've been studying in Exodus, how many Jews left Egypt. I'm going to talk about that a whole lot more. When we get to the point where we're beginning to count the number of adult male, that it gives that number to us in the text, the adult males who were age 20 and over, and it tells you how many were out of each tribe that came out at the Exodus. And then how many would that count out to be? You know, the modern American way of thinking says that that probably means there are about 2 million of them. No, because that would have been, with all the men who came out, age 20 and over, that would have been a husband and a wife and 1.8 children. I don't think that was the case when they came out of Egypt. Now we've just begun that in the morning messages this morning about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt the night that they had to leave in haste. But even if there were only two million, how much food would that have required? How much stuff did they leave behind? Think about how much stuff two million Americans would leave behind. If two million Americans had to immediately flee to Canada, how much stuff would they have to leave behind? I think it's a lot more than that. A minimum of six million, perhaps up to 10 million or more that came out of Egypt. It was a big movement of people, folks. We'll talk about that more when we get to Exodus. We know with relative certainty that Paul's father was a tent maker, and I had just mentioned that in passing, but I'm going to give you the verses tonight and talk about it a bit. I want to expand on that a little. Because the father always taught his son the trade. Although it was a possibility that a son might be academically inclined and able to progress in rabbinic training, he always learned to do something with his hands. With Paul, his rabbinic training was under the most famous rabbi of the Dale. They, I mean, he could have he could have had his ticket written, and he'd never have to have touched dirty work for one minute. He was accepted as one of the very best under one of the very best in the strictest training in Jewish history. Gamaliel. By the way, Gamaliel was a moderate Pharisee. I'll show you that in just a second. 
Gamaliel was what we would call a moderate in that he was a skilled, astute politician in the way that he could manipulate the other side. We see some of that going on right now in the presidential so-called debates that are happening in our country. Let me read you something out of Acts 18, because it tells you that Paul was, in fact, the tent maker I just mentioned in passing last week. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, this is chapter 18, verse 1, and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, um, and we know the historical record behind this. I've talked about it in some detail, uh, about how Caesar had expelled all the Jews out of Rome, and it tells you that in the verse, too. I found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. He was of the same craft, it says. In other words, he was a tent maker by trade, even though he had been a student of Gamaliel. Also interesting. You know, Claudius had commanded the Jews to depart from Rome. Can, can you imagine? Suppose Congress and the President and the Supreme Court all decided all at once, and all the governors of all the states agreed, and all the state representatives and senators and whatever you happen to have in your state, all decided, we're tired of Christians. They've all got to leave. And so you have to pick up your roots, and they give you 30 days to do it. And you have to either move to Canada or to Mexico or someplace else in the world. Suppose you had to do that and you could never come back here. Do you know how to do anything where you could make a living? Do you have any life skills whereby you could, and that's a generous 30 days, within 30 days be transported someplace else in the world and have to be independent financially. Folks, these things happen in history. I suspect some of them are going to happen in the near future in the United States. If they don't just kill us, they could just decide to do what they did with Aquila and Priscilla. All the Jews got to get out of Rome. All the Christians got to get out of the United States. Hey, if you're willing to deny Christ, that's fine. You can stay. But if you want to insist on all that bigoted narrow-minded kind of stuff that you fundamentalists preach all the time, you've got to get out of here. We are tired of you Christians. You say it never happened here. Really? That's what the German Christians thought in Germany before Hitler came into power. And he not only killed Jews and gypsies and the mentally retarded and the handicapped and old people he targeted Bible-believing Christians who wouldn't go along with the Nazi socialist system. People don't think it can't happen again. Do you have any life skills that you could take with you to transport someplace else to be able to support yourself and support your family? Paul did. He abode with them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for that is, he worked. You know, he didn't sit around and tell them, now look, I think the next hit you ought to do is over there, like this. See, and, and really, I don't want to touch the needle, but you pick up the needle, and here's how you do it. For by their occupation, they were tent makers, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He was bivocational. He was in full-time ministry, and he was also making tents to support himself. Now, his teacher, let's talk about his teacher for just a second. We first hear of Gamaliel in the New Testament immediately after, and this, I think, is very interesting context. It's immediately after the Ananias and the Sapphira fiasco in Acts chapter 5. And then the apostles are doing a whole bunch of healings, and people are coming from all over the place to bring their sick to have the apostles heal them. Even if Peter can just walk by and his shadow passes over him, I mean, they're excited about that. 
And you know, the government didn't like it. And they arrest all the apostles and they throw them in jail. And then the angel of the Lord comes at night, opens the jail, says, go out and stand in the temple and preach. You know what the angel of the Lord came? Now, he didn't do that same thing later on when, when Peter was arrested and Herod was going to kill him. But here early in Acts, in Acts chapter 5, the angel of the Lord said, go back into the temple and stand there and preach. With Peter, the angel of the Lord just opened the gates of the prison the day before Peter was going to get killed and got him out into the street. Peter thought he was seeing a vision. And then Peter thought about it for a minute and went over to the home of John Mark and then told them all that had happened. Then he disappeared and they all got excited. And remember Rhoda who tried to, who was so excited, the little girl so excited she could even open the door for Peter, but ran and told everybody Peter's outside and they thought, oh no, we've been praying for Peter, but God never answers prayer like that. Right? God doesn't answer prayer like that. I mean, we pray because we're supposed to pray, but God doesn't answer prayer, right? And Peter kept on knocking. And so they went, and they said, well, it must be his angel. Finally looked, and sure enough, it was Peter. Did you know God answers prayer? Now, that wasn't in the text here tonight. But, you know, th these are things, folks, are you praying right now? These are things that apply to what we're doing now. We're in crisis situation level one. They were up to about level three or four at that point. Now's the time to start praying for those in authority over us. They are legitimate positions in government. Their responsibility in those positions is the protection of believers. And God used even the evil Roman government to protect believers. That's why we pray for them. But anyway, so when we first hear about Gamaliel, it's in Acts chapter 5, immediately after the Ananias and Sapphira fiasco and the arrest and miraculous release from prison of all of the apostles, beginning in verse 33. And then Peter and the apostles stand in front of them and say, look, you guys killed Jesus. You're responsible. You're going to get, you're going to get nailed for it. And it says, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Now here's where Gamaliel first shows up, verse 34. Then stood up there one of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and I told you before that Gamaliel is considered one of the top seven rambans, that is rabbis, in all of Jewish history. Here he is in the New Testament. He's Paul's teacher. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, we're going to have a private discussion, guys. We don't want them to hear this because we don't want them to, know, them to know what we're doing. But I want to give you a wise approach to the problem. And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. Now remember, Gamaliel is a Pharisee. Pharisees believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. The Sanhedrin was composed partly of Pharisees and partly of Sadducees. We saw that how when Paul came down to them uh, to present his case just a few verses ago, that they practically tore him in pieces because the Pharisees said, hey, if an angel or spirit spoke to him, hey, let's not fight against God. They're quoting the position taken by Gamaliel all the way back in Acts chapter 5 in relation to the other 12 apostles. What politics are going on here? We'll talk about that in just a second. Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves. Rather interesting. There were only 40 assassins that wanted to kill Paul. And the Romans were scared enough to send ten times and more that number to get Paul safely out of Jerusalem. Now here are 400 of them, but you know what? They were slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. 
After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing. Do we have any tax protesters uh, around the United States today? Are there a few? Yeah, there sure are. Um, I saw another interesting thing that one of my kids had posted. Uh, it said, um, true or false, the reason we pay taxes is to support the poor and to uh, pay for roads and bridges uh, and to make sure we have national security. And the answer is false. You pay taxes so that you don't go to jail. <laughs> yeah. And so here we've got tax protesters all the way back at the times of uh, Judas of Galilee. It says he drew away much people after him. He also perished. And all, even as many obeyed him, were dispersed. Now he's drawing their attention to some political realities because the Romans are in charge. And now I say unto you, this Gamaliel speaking, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Now you know he's right. He's speaking a truism, an obvious truth. He's put it in the context of political reality. If it's the work of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply be found to even fight against God. And to him they agreed. Interesting. Everybody on the Sanhedrin, there are, of course, Sadducees and Pharisees. Those are two big political parties. There were a few independents, the Herodians, that were on the Sanhedrin at this time. But they all agreed on that. It's what's called pragmatism. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, so we'll do something about it, but we won't do enough about it to get ourselves in trouble with the guys who have the real power. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now I want you to notice something else. These are Christians. They understand the business about being in subjection to authority. How do they respond to that at this moment? They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and then they do exactly what they were told not to do. Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Is the problem that they're in rebellion against authority? No. The problem is they are obeying the highest authority. God himself had given them command to preach and teach Jesus. Now if they'd been told don't do panhandling anymore in the streets of Jerusalem, they'd have been violating that law. If they'd have been told don't run around naked in Jerusalem, and they had done that, they would have been violating that law. But they were told don't preach Jesus. And they said, we've got to preach Jesus. It doesn't matter what the government does to us. We've got to preach Jesus. It's a rather significant thing for us in a day in which government is trying to confine the preaching of Jesus to the four walls of the church and then eventually take that away from us too. Now we need to understand in these passages, because this is important for what I'm talking about in terms of work tonight, the Gamaliel was also scoring political points against the Sadducees with his wait-and-see rationalistic argument. He's a politician. He's scoring political points so that he can get his own way. But it's interesting to later note that his pupil, Paul, got letters from the high priest to go to Damascus and arrest Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem. Almost every one of the high priests, and at that time the high priest, was a Sadducee. You see the political shove and push and give and take that's going on here? Gamaliel is a Pharisee. He's gaining political points with his argument. 
But later on, the Apostle Paul, if he wants to go to Jerusalem, to Damascus, he has to get letters from a Sadducee high priest. And so the Sadducees are scoring points against the Pharisees by using Paul, one of Gamaliel's top students. I think the political sphere today is no different, as illustrated by the recent endorsement of Donald Trump by Ben Carson. You know, Jews have historically scorned men, and we talked about this a little bit last week. I want to talk about it a little more tonight. The Jews have historically scorned men who focused on book learning without ever learning how to do something profitable and practical. In Israel, you had to learn how to work with your mind and with your hands. Not everybody made it academically, and so they ended up doing most of the manual labor, but it also meant that every Jewish scholar also had a practical life skill that he could do with his hands if the bottom ever dropped out of academia. Or, for example, in the case of Aquila and Priscilla, if they ever got expelled someplace. They had something they could do, that they could take with them, that they knew how to function in the real world. You know, that same attitude is still prevalent in Israel today. In fact, I can remember when Judy and I lived back in Israel many years ago, uh, hearing two little boys in discussion about the work that their fathers did. Now, in Israel, there is a bus line. Back then, it was the preeminent, predominant bus line. I don't know if it still is today, but 40 years ago it was. It was called Egid. Egid was the name of the bus line. And so uh, one little boy was talking about how <coughs> his dad was a doctor. And that was very impressive to all the other little kids. And the other little boy in the conversation piped up and said, yeah, but my dad is an egged bus driver. <laughs> and he won the conversation. <laughs> they had learned how to do something. The little kid looking up to his dad. You know, little children look up to him. They want to know, do you know how to do anything? The rabbis taught, whoever does not teach his son a trade is as if he brought him up to be a robber, unquote. Whoever does not teach his son a trade is as if he brought him up to be a robber. If he does not do anything, the only thing, he, only way he can make a living is to go out and shoplift or panhandle or steal something from somebody else or go out to the highway and become a highwayman and beat people up and take what they've got. The Apostle Paul talks about that with himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. These are verses I didn't give you last week. 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 16. Paul's talking about what he has to go through as he carries the gospel. And he says, Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. He didn't even own his own house. Much less two or three of them in a place down at the shore. Look at verse 12. And labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. He puts that in the list. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made the filth of this world, and we are the offspring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as beloved sons, I warn you, for though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. Fathers talk their sons in work. You've got a lot of people out there who are teaching you stuff. But I'm your father, says Paul. I want you to understand what I'm doing. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, look at the last five words of verse 16. Be ye followers of me. What's the positive thing in that entire list of all the suffering that he did? One positive thing. We labor working with our own hands. Be ye followers of me. How about 1 Thessalonians 2.9? For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, 
Paul worked a lot of midnight shift type of jobs. Paul often worked around the clock. Paul didn't have an eight-hour shift that ran five days a week and he got overtime for it. But he did anything beyond 40 hours. Laboring night and day. Paul burned the midnight oil. Paul's candle burned down to a stump. And Paul kept on working because, you know, as we've been going through the book of Acts, Paul often had men who were traveling with him, and Paul talks about how he actually supported some of them. There are not many missionaries on the mission field today who are not only working to support themselves, but also to support their team. Paul has set a rather high standard and example for us to follow. Remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God. In other words, Paul says, right, the Thessalonians, some interesting problems at the Thessalonian church. We'll maybe do that someday and take the two of Thessalonian epistles. But the apostle Paul says, you know, I work so that you wouldn't have to pay my salary. You know, in several of the churches where I've pastored, I have also worked so the church wouldn't have to pay my salary. Paul did that. It's quite biblical. Chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. Beginning in verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, these are all new verses. You haven't heard any of this before. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught by God to love one another. There's a positive thing. An example of all. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. In other words, don't just stagnate and say, well, I've done enough. Here's the second thing that he tells them to do. Love the brethren and increase in that love. Verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands. As we gave a suggestion as an option, one thing or another, no, it says, as we commanded you, doesn't sound very optional to me. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. There are two reasons for the work that Paul gives here. Number one, unbelievers are watching you. They've heard what you have to say. Now they're watching you to see whether or not you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Or whether they have a reason to criticize you. And number two, so that you lack nothing. What you do in relation to those on the outside and what you do in relation to your own provision. Another passage we haven't looked at. 2 Thessalonians 3, six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Now you've heard me at many times in the past tell you the word disorderly there means lazily. And not after the tradition which he received of us. In other words, Paul says, I'm not lazy. You know there are a lot of Christian men that are lazy. They really are. It, it's built into us, by the way. It's, all people are that way. We all have some laziness. But he says, you know, do the lazy thing. Paul says, that's why I keep it in my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Not after the tradition which you received of us. In other words, I don't do that. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. Here again, he's telling them, follow his example. He'd already told them before, back in at Corinth, now we're at Thessalonica. Thessalonica. He told them at Corinth, follow my example. In other words, work with your own hands. Here he's saying the same thing to the Thessalonians. Work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you walk honestly toward them that are without, and that you may have lack of nothing. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, not after the tradition which you received of us, 
for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. Here he says it again. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly or lazily among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. We weren't moochers. But wrought with labor and travail night and day. Here again he makes reference to the fact that he worked the long shifts. That we might not be chargeable to any of you. These were Gentiles. They weren't used to that kind of thing from scholars. I did mention that last week. That we might not be chargeable to any of you. Paul had no fear of talking to them bluntly because Paul was willing to work. A lot of preachers are not willing to work. Paul had the authority not to have to work. He says so in the next verse. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us third time. He talks about following his example of work. Folks, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around this church. Your preacher does a lot of it. Now, some of you do some, and I appreciate that very much. But there's a lot of work. Hard work. You say, I don't know how to do it. Then learn how to do it. You know, most of the things that I do now, in terms of electrical, in terms of mechanical, in terms of construction, in terms of cement work, in terms of many other things that I do around here, I taught myself how to do them because I believe these passages and I set an example. I bought the tools. I bought tools that most men don't have. But they're tools that are necessary to do the work around here so that I might not be chargeable to any of you. I don't get paid for those things. No extra bonuses for the things that I do around. I want to follow Paul's example. I hope you men do too. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, because he did have, that's the word exousia, that's not dunamis, that's exousia there, which means the authority, the power of authority, not the power of you know strength like Superman kind of power but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. He didn't put it up as one of those possible petty suggestions that really don't have much importance. It's a command. If it was a command to them, it's a command to us. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. <laughs> Church tenders, maybe. This definitely accounts for Paul's sharp words to the Gentile churches where the Greek idea of manual or mental activity, philosophy, and refusal to mix work with thought prevailed. And that was the standard way in which the Greeks thought because the Greeks thought in terms of slaves doing the work. By the way, let me say something practical here. We have one young lady here tonight. Uh, two young ladies. And um, maybe some young ladies listening on the internet. Young ladies, I would encourage you not to look twice at any guy who has never learned how to do anything practical. Never look twice at him. Because you want a guy who can support you when the bottom drops out of everything, like it did with Aquila and Priscilla. You want a guy who is willing to work to care for his family instead of expecting his wife to support him. Does he know how to do anything? Not just does he know how to talk and try to get other people to do the work for him. That's the slave owner mentality. And it makes for a very miserable marriage. Is he willing to humble himself and get his hands dirty because he loves his wife and he himself would rather starve before he ever lets her be deprived? Guys, develop what used to be called the Protestant work ethic. It goes back to the principles that I'm talking about here tonight. We have some young men with us tonight. You need to develop that. You know, I'm very glad that my dad taught me to work with my hands. He didn't have to. 
He was skilled in many different things. But he taught me not to be afraid of hard work or to scorn manual labor. In fact, my parents insisted under threat of banishment to Siberia, not really, but that I had to work. They insisted on it. Even when I was a preteen, I had to do at that point all of our family yard work. And in Texas, we had yards that were more than half an acre large. One place in Kerrville was almost a full acre that I had to cut the grass in the miserable, hot Texas sun and do all the weeding of all the gardens and everything else and trim the bushes and all that stuff. And I was like nine or ten years old. By the time I was 11 or 12, I had regular outside jobs, cutting lawns, walking a two to three mile route, throwing over 200 papers twice a day, both morning and evening. Later, doing janitorial work, doing factory work, learning to be a radio announcer, cooking for 600 students every morning to pay my way through college, and so on. I did lots of jobs, sometimes as many as holding down three jobs at once and working a total of somewhere around 13 to 14 hours a day because I had two or three jobs. My parents never let me get a free ride. I had to work. And you know something? I appreciated my education a whole lot more than if I had just bummed my way through school. Let me develop that just a little bit because it's practical to the modern American church. Paul refers repeatedly to the link between work and payday. The physical realm is the visible portrayal of the spiritual realm. I think I may have said last week, because I'd like to say this, there is no such thing as a spiritual welfare state with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work with what sort it is. God's going to test your work. If any man's work abide, which he hath built there upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. This is not a, a question of whether or not you're going to lose your salvation. It's a test of your work. Did you do it for the glory of Christ? Did you do it in harmony with and in obedience to the word of God? Did you do it for the glory of God? Or did you do it because you wanted to get rich? What was your motive? You know, motives count a lot. If your motive was covetousness, you know what? It's going to be burned up. doesn't matter how much you earn. doesn't matter how much you gave. What was your motive? When your work is put to the test of fire, what's going to happen to it? I think I mentioned last week, lest any of you think that pastoral work is sort of a cushy job. You know the old saying, well, it may not pay much, but you sure can't beat the hours 11 to 12 on Sunday. Um, in the Bible, full-time Christian ministry is considered work, and as we've seen in Acts, it can be highly dangerous work, uh, as dangerous as any secular job. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Same word is used there, ergon. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor, work. We're going to give account for it someday, folks. And here he's talking about ministry, work. 1 Corinthians 16, 10, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Timothy wasn't a tent maker, so Paul's not referring to his secular work. He's talking about ministry work. Philippians 2.30 Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service to me. Throughout the New Testament we find those who are involved in ministry work, and it's called work, ergon, exactly the same as manual labor. What pastors and evangelists do is considered by God to be valid work. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. 1 Timothy 4.5 But watch thou in all things and do afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Ephesians 4.12 For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I did talk to you last week about work being personal, you don't bump a right off of everybody else. 
in Galatians 6, 4, every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. How God remembers the work that you've done. God is not unrighteous, Hebrews 6, to forget your work and labor of love, which you showed toward his name, so that you minister to the saints and do minister. Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom glory be glory forever and ever. Amen. You can't do it by yourself. We talked about that. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I talked about that more in detail a moment ago. 2 Thessalonians 3.12 Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that they, with quietness they work and eat their own bread. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 That you be steady to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. My time is up. I wanted to go into that a little bit because I think the day is coming here in America when if you don't have a portable job skill, you're going to starve. If you don't have something you can take, if you have to go on the run, if you don't know how to do anything, if you've always depended on others to do it for you, you will not survive. I hate to say that, but I think that day is coming here. We started out with the work of the military, with the soldiers who were transporting the Apostle Paul. We've seen different categories of work as we've gone through this passage here. We've seen how the responsibility of government is, in fact, to protect the Christians. But when the government doesn't protect the Christians, we've seen how the Christians survive. We talked about some of the text in Exodus that gives you some, some good hints as to what you ought to be prepared for. Now we're seeing here in Acts some other things that you need to be prepared for in case you get displaced. You know there are Christians all over the world right now being displaced, especially where Muslim terrorists are taking control and Christians are having to flee their countries and leave everything behind or be killed. Are you ready? Do you have any portable job skills? Or have you always depended on somebody else to do the work? It's not too late to learn. I'm still learning stuff. <laughs> Just put in an internet line. I had no idea how to do that before I started doing it. And you know what? I read stuff and found out how to do it, and I got it right. First time I ever did it in my life. I have no idea why God taught me that. He never teaches us to do something that doesn't become practical to us later on. He always gives us experiences so we can take those experiences and use them somehow to bring Him glory. Never too late to learn. Well, our time is up. In fact, I'm six minutes over. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It's practical. It tells us what we ought to be doing. Paul didn't say, I have a suggestion for you. He said, for we commanded you to work with your own hands. Learn how to do something. Because you know that is an incredible, wonderful thing. When push comes to shove, you can survive. Very practical. So, Father, once again, we thank you for the time we've had here tonight. We pray that you'll teach us the practical things of your word, not just the so-called theological things, which we all revel in because that's intellectual learning. But the practical things, where the rubber meets the road, where we end up having to do something. Father, again, we thank you. We pray that you'll bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, our closing